Hi, my name is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and this is a video on developing brains and helping kids make good decisions in life. Uh, the focus here is really to look at uh, new information about the developing brain. We know a lot more about what happens during gestation to before the kid is even born, what happens in early life experiences, and all of these different things that um, contribute to the ability to make good decisions. And we also know a whole lot about what's going on when kids don't make good decisions. We all have experienced that. We know what it's like when a crazy teenager jumps in a car after drinking and and that's the end of it. And so these bad decisions, where do they come from? And so we know there's a lot of roots in habituating behavior over time. So we want to go through that. We also want to dispel a lot of the crazy myths that are out there about how brains develop. So we want to get some clarity there about, um, you know, you're born with perfectly functioning frontal lobes, okay? Um, what's missing are those rehearsals of neural networks related to good decision making and to choice and so we'll talk about how that works and what it is that we can do as teachers to contribute to that okay so how can we help kids practice better decision making mechanisms so that they don't have um, these terrible outcomes that might result if they don't do that and so as we go through a handful of these big ideas I really love it if you could uh, jot down anything that might be new or interesting to you and let me know so that um, when we focus uh, on the day when we meet we can actually go deeper into those particular concepts. So here's some big ideas to frame this discussion. Um, your brain adapts to what it does most. So we're gonna sort of pull that apart when we're together but basically um, habituation plays a huge role in decision making. So how you get used to making decisions makes an impact. So we're going to talk about how early choices about how to make good decisions is really important. And we're also going to talk about um, this big idea that all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience. So everything new that you're going to do has been in, is going to be influenced by all the things that have already happened to you. So um, let's just say you have this amazing fourth grade math teacher who's just gonna you know rock your world but you just had such a lousy experience in third grade um, that you're terrified and so you can't help but associate your interaction with that teacher with your past and so we're going to talk about how teachers can help kids you know sort of come to grips with their past and also leverage what they already know um, but not be hostage to some of those um, preconceived ideas about situations. It's also important to understand that um, what you know influences what you can know. This is why we say the more things that you know, the greater amount of things you can learn in the future because this is basically neuroplasticity, right? The more connections you've made, the more potential connections you can make in the future. So we'll kind of explain why that's, you know, physically what's going on in your brain, but also what that means um, conceptually in classes and how giving kids rich and varied experiences and multiple uh, visions of the same idea and concept is really uh, fantastic for their future learning as well. And also this idea that what you know changes how you know something new. And so this has to do with your own life uh, and, and as it goes on. And so how you actually approach things today might be different from what you do uh, next month or in five years or in 10 years. And so um, there's a constant dynamic change that occurs. We call this neuroconstructivism. So your brain is sort of continually building itself, but it's always changing slightly. Every single experience is sort of changing these neural networks. So we'll talk a little bit about how that impacts our craft um, and this art of teaching that we have. Um, and then we're going to leave with this really big idea about um, we don't say nature versus nurture anymore. We basically say nature, you know, you're born with your genes via nurture. You're definitely influenced by the experiences you have in the world, including things that happen in school. But there's this huge piece that has come out of resiliency studies that tells us that you also have free will. You get to choose. <laughs> so you get to decide a lot of things. Um, it might be in your nature. Uh, you have a tendency to have a short fuse and a bad temper, temper and you have a bully in the class. So nature and nurture have combined to sort of set you up for, for free fall here. But the really cool thing is you get to decide how you're going to react to that situation. You can tell a kid, you know, I know you're angry, labeling it, right? Because Tommy took your ball from you, okay, cause and effect. We label it, but then we also allow them to understand. I can understand 
you know, that emotion inside of you, you I, can, I can sense that you're angry, okay? Now what are you going to do about it? So your feelings are not the same as your emotions, which is kind of crazy, right? Emotions are of the body. It's the chemicals that get released. And the feeling is your decision about what to do about that. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to help kids understand that and that they are in more control than they think they are. We're going to base a lot of this information on a study um, that looks at adolescence from being from 8 years old all the way to 24. Crazy, right? But it's a longitudinal study that's being undertake, uh, undertaken right now. It's just Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study and with the goal of trying to understand what tips kids, what makes some kids fall into the decision of taking drugs and others not, uh, what tips kids into hanging with the wrong crowd, quote unquote. What tips kids um, towards good or bad behaviors? And so looking at this over time, what kinds of influences have heavier weight than others? And so I'll be sharing some of that information with you. We'll also talk about um, a lot of these myths around adolescence. Um, you know, can't learn anything past adolescence. It's kind of like all downhill from there. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, we'll get rid of those myths and we'll talk about why. Um, as we said before, all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience. Well, the older you are, the more experiences you have, the more uh, things are going to pass through that filter there, right? So uh, you can always learn, and you can actually learn more efficiently. Um, but we have to help kids get away from that idea that they're limited by that. So we'll look at choices, everyday decisions, you know, what people eat or who they hang out with or when they do their homework. And we're going to look at this uh, in the context of understanding how your brain, it takes a lot of energy to do stuff. And so your brain is always trying to conserve energy. And so how does it save energy by just sort of doing the easiest thing? So we'll talk about how to get around that, uh, look at different types of uh, decision-making processes that your brain goes through um, at a metacognitive level, level. And then we're going to talk about some real big tools that you can integrate into your classroom that would help kids um, make small decisions so they are better off making those bigger decisions. So if you have ideas or thoughts about this um, before we meet, please send me an email so that I can make sure that I incorporate them into our session when we meet together. And looking forward to it. Thanks.